lesser name, the main coverage name. of the lower house. I am Simone Absalom. The session will start with prayers, followed by a roll call of those in attendance. This is usually followed by questions and answers to questions, statements by ministers, items under public business, as well as a private members' motions. Before we begin, let's try a parliamentary trivia. The type of government in Jamaica is a democratic confederation. Is this fact or fiction? Stick around for the answer at the end of this introduction. The answer will also be posted on our Facebook page. On the agenda in this session, the sectoral debates. The sectoral debate is a public debate in the House of Representatives in which government ministers, junior ministers, are expected to record their performance and their projections since the previous year, while opposition spokespersons on the various portfolios will seek answers and criticize or support government programs and policies. This session's main speakers are members Dr. Andrew Wheatley, Daryl Vaz and Favel Williams. Under public business, debate on the bill entitled An Act to Amend the Public Procurement Act 2018 is set to be concluded. It should be noted that the agenda can be adjusted with items being added, removed or replaced. If you are planning to attend a session at Gordon House, here are some rules you need to keep in mind. No visitor shall create any act of disorder within the precincts of the house. No visitor shall be admitted to the house without first obtaining an admission card from the office of the clerk. Visitors who remain within the precincts of the house during a suspension of the session are asked to keep silent. No photography, videography or sketching of the proceedings is allowed unless so authorized by the presiding officer and there should be no smoking inside the parliamentary building. It's about time to go over to the proceedings, but before we do that, let's get the answer to our parliament trivia. The type of government in Jamaica is a democratic confederation. This is false. According to the Jamaica National Heritage Trust website, the type of government in Jamaica is a parliamentary democracy. Now over to the proceedings. Mrs. Robinson, Mr. Hutchinson, Dr. Wheatley, Dr. Tufton, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Malawu Holt, Mr. Spencer, Mr. Green, Mr. Terry Long, Mr. Main, Mr. R. Scott, Mr. Azan, Dr. Bloomfield, Mr. Brown, Dr. Brown Burke, Mr. Buchanan, Mr. Bontin, Dr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Clark, Mrs. Cuthbert Flynn, Ms. Daly, Mr. Daly, Mrs. Dalrymple Philibert, yes. Dr. Dunn, Mr. Fagan, Dr. Ferguson, Mr. Golden, Dr. Guy, Ms. Hannah, Mr. Hales, Mrs. Holness, Mr. Hilton, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Kelly, Dr. McNeil, Ms. Nita, Mr. Paulwell, Mr. Phillips, Dr. Phillips, Mr. Pickersgill, Mr. Redman, Mr. Robertson, Mr. Robinson, Robertson, Robinson, Robertson, Robinson is here. Okay. Mr. Stewart. Reverend Thwaites, Mr. Mr. Dwayne Vaz, Mr. Wright, 
Mr. Jackson, Mr. Montague, Mr. Witter, Mr. Brown, Mr. Chuck. Mr. Shaw, Mr. Robertson, Statements by Ministers. Mr. Speaker, you'll recall that at the last sitting of the House, I gave an undertaking that following on a question from the member for Eastern Westmoreland, I indicated that the Minister of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries would make a statement with respect to the damage that occurred during the recent flood rains. Um, I also am advised that the Minister of Labor and Social Security will also make a statement on the subject. The member from Southwest St. Catherine, um, whilst responsible for NWA, will respond to any specific questions regarding roads that might have been damaged and is prepared to respond, but not to make an initial statement as such. Mr. Shaw. Minister Shaw. Carl. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to provide an update on regarding the impact of last week's heavy rains and subsequent flooding and landslides in some parts of the island on the agricultural sector. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Meteorological Service of Jamaica reports that 10 parishes were affected by landslides and flooding as a result of the trough that affected the island between May 4 and May 7. Given the susceptibility of the agricultural sector to extreme weather events, the Rural Agricultural uh, Development Authority moved to conduct an urgent assessment of the level and value of the damage to the sector in a bid to ensure that there is no loss of production time. So, Speaker, I'm pleased to report, based on RADA's preliminary figures, that the damage was not as devastating as the $800 million loss at the same time last year, or even when compared with the $300 million in losses which were incurred in November and December 2017. RADA has indicated, Mr. Speaker, the following. Total hectares impacted 136.9 hectares. Estimated tons of produce lost 1,520 tons. Total number of farmers affected in crops and livestock are close to 1,200 farmers. Estimated value, $76.5 million. And the number of livestock lost, mostly poultry, 1,649. Main parishes affected, St. Andrew, Clarendon, St. Anne, St. Catherine, St. Thomas, St. Elizabeth, Manchester, Westmoreland. Mr. Speaker, while we are happy that the damage was not major, some of our small farmers were in fact affected and are in need of assistance and we are committed to providing this support to get these farmers back on their feet. We are particularly sensitive to the onset of fungal and bacterial diseases, especially in relation to the Irish potato crop, which is uh, in process at this time. The House will recall the steady progress the country has made in the production of Irish potatoes with over 90% self-sufficiency last year. 
In order to maintain this, we will move to provide farmers with the chemicals they need to stave off the leaf blight disease that has arisen and which could seriously affect the output in the middle of the potato season. Mr. Speaker, despite its effects, when we get too much over too short a period of time, the sector needs rain. In that regard, we are satisfied with the level of rainfall this year, which resulted in a 2.1% increase in production of domestic food crops for the first quarter of this year. To capitalize on the weather, to capitalize on the good weather, as is customary, the Ministry will place at the disposal of members of Parliament, in collaboration with RADA, funds to be dispatched to our registered farmers in a bid to hasten the process of getting them back on their feet. Each rural constituency will be given $1 million, while our urban constituency will receive $600,000. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Ferguson. Mr. Oh, Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the opposition would like to thank the minister for his, for his presentation this afternoon, eight parishes impacted, almost $80 million reported, and um, 1,200 farmers. But Mr. Speaker, I'm aware, and I know the minister is aware, because in his presentation he spoke about the situation as it related to rains from last year, but I know very well that the minister would also remember that we had significant rainfall in falls in January also. Overall, from these rainfalls, the farmers have suffered significantly. And one area of the sector that we sometimes overlook are our fisher folks who many times after these rainfalls, they have to be out of business, outside of when they would have lost pots and uh, boats, etc. They would have been out of business for some time, which impacts family, the coastline, and also impact the communities in terms of commerce. We recognize that members of parliament would be given in the rural areas $1 million, urban areas 600000 But again, if we take into account eight parishes were impacted, and we're not talking against those who received who would not have been impacted, but we are also saying the significant number of farmers have impacted would have been in the area of poultry. And therefore, what we look forward is not just this response on this occasion, but the accumulated impact of the rainfalls over time. And we're also looking forward as it relates to the infrastructure, the roads, the farm roads, that have been impacted by, by this recent rain also. And therefore, Mr. Minister, what we would like to see is a, a quick movement of the farm road program, which is slated for this year to be $800 million, that those parishes that have been impacted, we will see some quick movement that will bring us back to normality. We thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Mr. Speaker. Just like my colleague, we appreciate the gesture. And uh, we're happy to know that farmers in rural constituencies, along with urban, will be giving some form of compensation for, for what really happened. However, in addition to what was stated really, farm roads, a lot of other roads that have been affected throughout this flooding, especially in Westmoreland. And uh, because of the commercial aspects of the constituency and these main roads that would really accommodate a lot of this commerce, we're wondering what steps will be put in place to quickly assist with a lot of the drain cleaning and also some rehabilitation of some of the roads that would have been affected. So I know it wouldn't necessarily be covered everything in your statement. I was hoping that Minister Warmington would also be given a statement. But because, of, of course, it's a Minister, Minister of Agriculture, Industry and Commerce, we're just hoping that we can get some information with regards to how quickly some efforts will be placed in remedying this situation, especially in certain areas of Westmona that was flooded in the, in the recent heavy rains. So I'm just asking if we can get some information on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I, I too am grateful for the assistance, but just a quick question. <coughs> Uh, mention was made that this is for persons who are registered farmers, yes? Registered farmers. I, I just have a concern in relation to a lot of females in my constituency, and I'm sure others, who are not necessarily registered as farmers, but may raise some chickens or whatever it is in an attempt to send their children to school and other things like that. When, when it is slated that they have to be registered farmers, I'm, I'm just saying, if, if RADA can do their checks and verify that these individuals are small poultry farmers are, and otherwise livestock or whatever it is that they do, whether or not the assistance could also be given to these persons. See that most of them, as I said before, are single parents who are struggling trying to send their kids to school. <coughs> Mr. Sim. Okay, okay, all right. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Minister Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honorable members uh, for their comments. Um, let me just say that the, the issue of farm road repairs is something that the government is taking quite seriously. And uh, we did, as you know, Mr. Speaker, last year we spent, I think, almost $500 million, $470 million on farm road repairs, which itself was a record. And now this new year we are breaking that record by allocating $800 million for expenditure. And I want to advise the the honorable member that just uh, just the end of last week I approved the list of roads in all constituencies for, for farm road repair and that should be we'll be tabling that list in Parliament uh, uh, very shortly so that is and, and, and we expect that that work must commence without delay so that, that is the, the case of the farm road repair program. And I want to indicate as well that, that the member from Westmoreland who mentioned the question of drain cleaning, we must not forget that the parish councils do have an amount allocated each month 
to be used towards maintenance of Paris Council Road. So uh, you might wish to take a look at that to make sure that you're getting your due allocation and that the money is being expended for that purpose. In terms of main roads, no one can deny, Mr. Speaker, that there has been a lot of work being done on our main roads island-wide. And I'm sure that the Minister of State will confirm that that work will continue apace. And I have been singularly quite pleased to see the level of work that is being done, both in respect of main roads and now in respect of farm roads. And so, Mr. Speaker, in respect of the issue raised by the member from St. Anne, uh, let me say that while the, the emphasis here is on registered farmers, and we want to encourage our farmers to get registered, and, and um, this includes female farmers. The female farmers are not disqualified from registering. In fact, they are very qualified to be registered as well. So I'd encourage the member to encourage his farmers to register with RADA so that they, they will ensure that they get assistance. Thank you. So, Minister, you mentioned the work that is being done at the roads, but the question I asked was if there will be any emergency funding being put in place to cover some of the drain cleaning for the NWA roads. So that was the question I asked. I was hoping I would get an answer for that particular question. Mr. Speaker, if I should respond. From the report I received, there is no catastrophic damage done in the last rain. But the issue is that every single member of parliament received $12 million over Christmas. Every member of parliament. And I would have, ex it was for drain cleaning, bushing, and patching. I'm surprised that members are still asked about patching in their constituency. I'm going to speak. I am speaking. Every member of parliament received that amount in, in December. But it depends on what the priorities were for the members of parliament. And the issue is that if we concentrated on bushing then, we would not have much to show today. In Southwest St. Catherine, we concentrated on drain cleaning and patching, and I'd expected that members of parliament would concentrate on that. At this stage, we are not making allocations now for drain cleaning based, based on the allocation we had then. We are hoping that in the second phase, then we can look at allocation for drain cleaning. But we got enough. We have taken care of that. Where there are, where there are serious cases of land slippage and such, huh? the, the National Works Agency is addressing those, those right now. If there, Mr. Campbell, you said no. You not spend none of your constituents. Rot them out. Mr. So speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. The, Mr. Phillips, the minister, in his um, response a while ago, basically misinforming the general public and the parliament because he's given the impression that the money that was given in Christmas was given for drain cleaning itself when that was not the case. Last year, there was only one allocation for drain cleaning outside of what was given for Christmas. Now the question is, now that the hurricane season is coming upon us, and we have seen the irregular spend on drain cleaning coming into the hurricane season, the question to the minister, is there going to be a program that will take place prior to the hurricane season? Also, from the flood rains that we had last year, especially the ones in the earlier part of last year, 
where there were some bridges damaged in Clarendon, namely the Shettlewood Bridge in Northwest Clarendon, and the Alley Bridge in Southwest Clarendon, where there are still not yet any works done on them. Down in Southwest Clarendon and parts of Central Clarendon, where you had flooding more than once last year, and no major no major drain cleaning program has taken place in those. So the question to the minister, will there be a comprehensive drain cleaning program, seeing that we are seeing more flooding right across the, 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 the island, a mitigation program taking place through the National Works Agency to mitigate from some of these floodings that we are seeing? Because if not, if we, the little rain that we got last week and the week before happens any time further down in the year, then it is going to be worse than we see, and the loss of life may be taking place. Mr. Speaker, I can't be blamed if the member needs an hearing is aid or something. I did say. I don't know if the member has a problem with, with hearing. I did say the 12 million that we got, every member of parliament across the board in December, was for drain cleaning, bushing, and patching. But members determined their priorities then. That's what I said. But there are members who believed, there are members whose priority was for bushing, not for cleaning drains or for patching. In Southwest St. Catherine, our priority was for patching, okay? And there has been allocation since. The issue is, I said to, on the basis of that, there won't be an allocation now, because we normally have it in March and in July. So I said for the first part, there will be none based on the allocation we had then to do that. But I said in the second phase, there will be. I did say that, and the second phase will be before the hurricane season. I did say that. Please. Members, le members, let me remind you. Order, please. Oh, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. Let me remind you, this is not a debate. Questions, this is not a debate. Turn and look in the standing orders. If you have a question to the minister who will have the statement, you say the statement and address the speaker. You mentioned the issue of the bridges. The member from Clarendon spoke to me this morning, and I'm surprised that you guys don't converse with each other. He spoke to me, and I, addressed, and I advised him this morning of the arrival of the bridges. He spoke to me about it, and I advised him. So the issue is you ought to communicate with each other. Otherwise, you would have made a statement because he spoke to me. Sit down. Sit down and stop being an idiot. You think on your foot made a pan? Sit down and stop being an idiot. You think on your feet made a pan? Sit down and stop being an idiot. You think on your feet made a pan? Sit down and stop being an idiot. You are being irrelevant. Mr. Speaker, be slashy. You are being slashy. Sit down. Mr. Speaker. Come, bro. Mr. Warmington, please. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. The member from Southwest St. Catherine is given the impression that Mr. Mr. Campbell, yes. Mr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell, yes, sir. this is not a debate. Not debating, sir. If you have a question for Mr. Shaw, ask him. That's not a minister's statement. Uh, not debating, I am sir. not going to entertain. You have asked your questions already. I am you have asked questions already. I am clarifying a matter, sir. Proceed if you have a further question. This is a not a debate, and I'm going to stand by that. I'm not debating, Go ahead. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm not debating. But I, I want for you, sir, to be reminded that each member in this house is duly elected to this house and has a right to speak in this house. And your, your continued attempt Mr. 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 Campbell. What do you mean, Dose? Mr. Campbell. What do you mean, Dose? Mr. Campbell. What do you mean, Dose? It is the truth. Order, please. Mr. Campbell, have a seat, please. Mr. Have your seat. Let me address you.
each member in this house is elected and the speaker is elected and the speaker has been given certain authority and I'm going to advise you that this is not a debate you have asked your questions already if you have a further question for Mr. Shaw I'm not going to entertain any debate with Mr. Warmington neither from you nor him so please do not proceed on that matter you have a question? Ask Mr. It's Shaw. It's a point of order then, sir. Because Minister what, Shaw. It's a point of order then. Because what the member from Southwest, St. Catherine, said. Point of order. A point of order. I did not, I'm on my feet. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I did not rise in the seat as member from Southwest. They spoke to me as Minister of State. And I addressed the house in that capacity. So don't talk about my comment. <laughs> yeah, just let me just stay. And a point of order to the minister. A point of order to the minister of state. <laughs> the, the impression being given, Mr. Speaker, is that somehow members were, had some latitude to spend this $12 million any way they, they so decided, which is not true. The allocation that was given, there was a set portion of it that was assigned for patching. And, and for, the, for the Minister of State to rise and suggest that it was spent in a wanton way is misleading the House. And it, it Mr. could Campbell, not be, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Campbell, it Mr. Campbell, could not be that Dr. drain Campbell, cleaning is something that is Dr. only Campbell, going to be done once per year. Dr. Thank Campbell. you, sir. Please. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, could the Honourable Minister of State be a little bit more specific as to when the second quarter will start for the road patching? If you have a... Mr. That Mr. Warmington is not authorized at this time to speak in this house. If you have a question for him, put it in writing. If you have a question for Mr. Shaw, who has made a statement, proceed to ask him. Mr. Warmington, do not rise to answer any question at this time. You are not so authorized by the speaker. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, in respect, in respect to the questions being asked, I refer to Standing Order 17.2, which guides us, all of us, Speaker, members. And I read, after the answer to a question has been given, supplementary questions may at the discretion of the speaker. Not complete. Don't go any further. No, no. Mr. Speaker, could I be given the courtesy of completing the, the section I'm making reference to? Because if taken in part, it will be misleading. Mr. Jackson, listen, listen to me carefully. The, the person to whom you must ask a question is the Minister of Mr. Speaker, I have not completed the question to point to you. You're answering the question prematurely. I read, Mr. Speaker, section 17.2. After the answer to a question has been given, supplementary questions may, at the discretion of the Speaker, be put for the purpose of elucidating the answer given orally. But the speaker may refuse any such question which, in his opinion, introduces matter not relevant to the original question, not relevant to the original question, or which infringes any of the provisions of the standing order 16. And we can read that. And may, in that case, direct that such question be not reported in the official record. In the instant case, Mr. Speaker, the member seeking clarification and quest and the statement made by the minister. And therefore, the privilege 
is for the minute the members to so exercise. And I crave your indulgence, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, let me address you. And let me repeat, the statement is by the Minister of Agriculture. Any question must be directed to the Minister of Agriculture and his statement. I have a question. Mr. Speaker. Let, 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 let oh. me finish, please. Mr. Any question to the Minister of State must be put in writing or get permission from the Speaker. And I'm not giving any permission for Mr. Warmington to answer any question here today. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you're Any question must be relevant to the yeah. statement by the Minister yeah. of Agriculture. Question if it's not, it will not question be permitted. Question the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, I draw your memory to the comments made at the beginning of the proceedings by the House Leader and also the statements made last week at last sitting. At the beginning of the sitting, the House Leader indicated that the Minister of Industry, Commerce and Agriculture will make a statement and the Minister of State, Minister Warmington, will be prepared to answer any question relating to roads. It is therefore within that context that the questions were, the clarification were further extended to Minister Warmington on the basis of the undertaking given by the House Leader. Mr. Jackson, regardless of what the Minister said the speaker is now advising you that if you have some question for the minister of state put it in writing and give it to me and i will approve them he can't tell you that he's going to get up here and answer question that i don't know about the speaker what is before me any question relevant to mr shaw's statement must question, be directed question to him. For the Minister Mr. of Speaker. Agriculture. Mr. And for the whatever Minister the Minister of said last week, then you should put it in writing and ask him. Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. If, Carl, if I Carl. may, Mr. Speaker. Carl. I hope I, I can Carl. clarify the situation. Who is Carl? Carl. Carl. Um, the Minister with responsibility for the agency dealing with the maintenance of roads is not in the house. Any formal questions that you wish to communicate to him, he will be here later on. You may table it or you may make reference to it so that it may be dealt with in a manner satisfactory to himself and yourself. To prolong this discussion and trying to force the Minister of State to deal with matters, and I've heard a couple of questions asked of him, that quite frankly, he's not in a position to answer. No, he's not, so therefore, so therefore, Mr. Speaker, I ask, I ask you, so I ask that you close this. No, could no, Carl, 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 Minister Warmington. Miss, no, um, Please. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, question for the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, Minister, um, there are a few Mr. Hilton, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A few consequences. Uh, come on, come on, may you just come on, sit down now. Sit down now. Um, <laughs> um, Minister, there are, uh, my consequences straddles both. Members, let me remind you, let me remind you, in case you have forgotten, you are in Parliament and what happened the other day will not and should not be permitted to happen again. Mr. I'm Speaker. asking members to operate as members of parliament and leaders in their constituency and leaders in this country. And I'm not going to stay here and allow members to write articles that I am the one who caused it. Mr. So I'm going to go by this. I'm going to go by the standing orders. Mr. Hilton, you have a question thank, for the Minister of thank Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You may proceed. Minister, there are consequences like mine that straddles both urban constituencies. There are a few constituencies like mine that straddles both urban and rural, and affected farm roads 
that are affecting the constituency. Are there special consideration for the, the, those constituencies that straddles both? Rural and urban. Rural agriculture, urban. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I. Member. Rural agriculture. Member, you want the answer? Member, you want the answer? Mr. Speaker, I take note of the, the question raised by the member. Uh, and I'll be pleased to meet with him to understand the exact nature. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that's one, that's one. Minister. <laughs> oh, what I ask him, where benefit me are you? Mr. You Phillips. benefit me are you? Mr. Phillips. Yes. Oh, Mr. Saka, I hardly hear myself. Order, please. Minister, the, 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 the issue of the registered farmers for, 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 for the inputs now because of the flooding. The, not all farmers are registered, but even unregistered farmers will get affected by, by, by the flood rains. The process now for a farmer to be registered, no, but it takes very long. As it is now, I, have, I can tell you about the parish of Manchester. Even three months passing after the person would have paid their $500, I'm just telling you what is happening in Manchester. Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips, Mr. Phillips, address the speaker with your question and do But when I'm addressing you, address speaker, you're not no, hearing, speak. so no, go ahead. I'm addressing the member. Address, you put, you put your right. question. I'm not going to answer Mr. Speaker, but what, what I was really asking, if, if, if there's some leniency if, in this period for the registration, for, for the registration of the farmers that we will be giving some of these inputs, because I said sometimes it takes a longer time for them to get. So you said yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Ministry of Labour and Social Security commenced intervention in the reported damage to houses, businesses, and infrastructure in the parish of Westmoreland since the heavy rains which affected the island on May 6, 2018. Some reports of damage were reported from the communities of McNeil Land and its environs. Namely, Station Road and Bay Road districts Assessments were carried out in three communities, and so far, 10 assessments have been completed. The assessments are ongoing in the flooded communities, and another 20 assessments will be completed in the coming weeks. However, presently, there are some areas that are still inaccessible. A team from the ministry, along with the mayor, parish disaster coordinator, and councillors, visited the affected areas and found that approximately 260 houses were affected. One shelter, the Eldin Washington Early Childhood Institution, was open to accommodate two families, totaling seven persons, three female adults, two boys, and two girls. Today, as we speak, the families have since returned home, and the shelter has been deactivated. The ministry has continued our intervention in the affected communities by providing 280 food packages along with the toiletries and cleaning agents to the affected families. Also, five matrasses were distributed to affected households. Approximately $600,000 was spent on relief supplies to assist victims of the flooding, and it is expected that another $900,000 will be paid out in emergency grants to affected families. The Ministry will continue to collaborate with the ODPEM and other agencies to provide additional support to families affected 
to aid in the recovery process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister Semudo, who is the next person? The next item. Now, Mr. Speaker, I had indicated that just the two? Minister of Labour and Social okay, Security would be the other person, and she has just spoken. Announcements. Laying on the table of the House today are Ministry Papers Numbers 40 to 53 of 2018. Performance of, for the financial year 2017-2018 and priority focus for 2018-2019 for the undermentioned agencies falling under the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology. The International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences the National Commission on Science and Technology, the Scientific Research Council, the Board of Examiners, the National Energy Solutions Limited, Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica, Petrojam Limited, Petrojam Ethanol Limited, Winton Windfield Wind Farm Limited, EGOV Jamaica Limited, E-Learning Jamaica Company Limited, Post and Telecommunications Department, Spectrum Management Authority, and the Universal Service Fund. Also laid on the table today are the annual report of the Consumer Affairs Commission for the year 2015-2016. The annual report of the Jamaica National Agency for accreditation for the year 2016-2017 and uh, the Independent Commission of Investigation. First quarterly report for 2018 for the period January to March 2018. Members, um, I wish at this time before you proceed, Minister, to recognize a number of people visiting with us today. We have heads of company, chairman of boards and directors, two former member of parliament, former ministers and senator. Will you welcome them for me, please? Bills brought from the Senate. Petitions. Papers, reports from committees, notice of motion given orally. Mr. Semudo. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Prime Minister, I beg to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move to introduce and have read a first time a bill entitled the Trusts Act 2018. Also, Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice at the next meeting of the House, I will move. Be it resolved that notwithstanding Standing Orders 32A1 and pursuant to Standing Order 86, that the Standing Orders of this Honorable House of Representatives be suspended such that this Honorable House be allowed to continue the sectoral debate which commenced on the first of day of May 2018 to its conclusion. Mr. Speaker, I further beg to give notice that at the latest stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take this motion. Mr. Tweet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move the following motion. Whereas the security forces have identified some 200 criminal gangs in Jamaica, be it resolved that this honorable house debate the reasons why young male Jamaicans attach themselves to gangs and determine policy strategies for stemming the growth of such gangs.
Notice of motion given orally. Questions and answers to questions. Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice that at the expiration of 21 days, I will ask the Prime Minister the following questions. Motion that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Dr. Campbell. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I tabled some questions last week on the section 15. I tabled some questions last week on the section 15. Seven days. The provision on the section 15 is for seven days. I, I'd like to get an indication from the Minister of Health as to when the question standing in mind will be answered. Your question is to the Minister of Health. Mr. Tufton, you are being asked and some questions that are presented to you when you will be able to answer. You have an answer to that? Mr. 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 Speaker, I received a letter. I, I received a letter from the... I received a letter from the clerk indic indicating that I should... I have up until the 29th of May to, res to, to respond to the questions. I'm trying to table them tomorrow. But I'm, I'm not sure yet. I'll discuss with the, with the House leader on that. But I have up until the 29th, based on the letter I received from the, from the clerk. <laughs> Say as you may, Mr. Speaker. Go ahead, Dr. Campbell. There are different provisions in the standing order, sir. One of them gives the, the minister 21 days, standing order 15, which we use to table the questions, give the minister seven days. So I don't know whether or not he was misinformed, right? But the specific provision under which we table the questions is for seven days for us to receive answers. Mr. Kiam, you will appreciate that if you ask the minister some questions which require research and otherwise, that he will and must come to us and advise us when he will be able to, re to answer your questions. And he has said, he has said that he will do so next week, you said, Minister? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm looking at the standing orders. Order. Through you, Mr. Speaker, 15, uh, section five, which speaks to a minister in relation to a matter directly related to his portfolio responsibility, which is of urgent national importance, it shall be put down for a day not earlier than seven clear days after it has been handed, handed to the clerk. I also have a letter here from the clerk, which has given me, Mr. Speaker, on the record, up to Tuesday, May 29th. And that is what I was operating uh, within that timeline. So I'm quoting from standing orders and from the letter that was given to me. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to get the, quest the answers as quickly as possible, and there may be a possibility I can do so tomorrow. But if not, I have time to do it for later. On a, on a point of order, Mr. 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 Speaker, it is clear that when the member from Northwest St. Anne asked the questions, he did indicate based on the section, 
the seven days time period. It is, however, can you, can you kindly give me a chance to complete my statement? It is, however, clear that somewhere along the line, the information which got to the minister did give him 21 days, as explained by the clerk. So we are gracious that you would want to consider, given the urgency of the circumstances, and a matter which is now very topical and of great interest of the nation, that you would seek to answer tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. Simuda, exactly. Motion that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motions relating to the sitting of the House. Motion for leave to introduce bills. Presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtained. Mr. Speaker, I now move to introduce and have read the first time a bill shortly entitled the Gun Court Amendment Act 2018. A bill shortly entitled the Gun Court Amendment Act 2018, read a first time. No, 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 no. Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice of second reading of the bill. Public business. Mr. Speaker, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion, notice of which I gave earlier. Those in favor? Those against? As I will proceed, Minister. Mr. Speaker, the response by members to the sectoral debate has been overwhelming. Most of the members so entitled to speak because of the portfolio responsibilities that they carry have expressed a desire so to do. It did not start as vigorously in the initial stages and it was felt then that it was possible for us to proceed and be able to get these debates completed in six days. As it has turned out, because of delays at the front of the debate, beginning of the debate, we, are now come, we have now come to a stage where we have as many as five speakers on one day. To give an example, Mr. Speaker, next Tuesday, I have been asked to support the following speakers. The Honorable Delroy Chuck, Mr. Anthony Hilton, Mrs. Marlene Malahu Fort, Mr. Julian Robinson, Miss Natalie Headley Nita, or Headley, and Ms. Yeah, Nita. No Headley, Headley's out. And and MP Horace Daly. Mr. Speaker, it's becoming unwieldy. And we have found, based on experience, that once we get into so many presentations, having extended the time for speaking, it would take us into the night, on most of these nights. But it's it. So I am recommending that we suspend the standing orders that govern these sittings and continue for another couple of weeks. I expect that we could perhaps get through comfortably within two more sittings of the House. But certainly we cannot continue like this because it would be tedious. So I ask that, ask for your approval of this motion. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Yes, I will. Go. Today, we will start with an attempt to close 
the matter that we started and was responded to by the opposition spokesman on finance, an act to amend the Public Procurement Act 2018. And now invite Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance, to close the bill and also to introduce in this House the appropriate amendments which will be taken in committee. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, just before the Minister closes the debate. Mr. 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 Speaker, Daly. yes. Yeah, Mr. Just before the Minister closes the debate on the Procurement Act, in fact, the regulations, I crave the indulgence of the Minister to allow me to make a few comments. As last week, Wednesday, I was not here, and as the person who chaired the Joint Select Committee in the past administration on the procurement, public um, sector procurement, I'm sure he would, um, he would not mind. Um, he's always a gracious young man. I'm sure he would have some comments I'd like to make. So with, with your permission, will you allow me? I won't be long. There are about three or four comments I would like to make because the committee, and when I presented the report of the committee, we pointed out that there were some specific reasons um, why we made some recommendations um, in this bill. And the first one has to do, I haven't, in fact, I didn't know you're closing today. The first one has to do with discussing with the relevant stakeholders, meaning the master builders and the contractors, the regulations before we brought it. That was a commitment that I gave on behalf of the then Minister of Finance, myself then as the Minister without portfolio in the Ministry of Finance, and the Chairman of the Joint Select Committee. We will recall that during the process of developing the Public Procurement Bill, which went to the Joint Select Committee, there was a, an issue with the contractors and the um, the, the, what do you call it, the contractor gentleman there? The, the contractor general. A lot of contractors were in conflict with the contractor general, and therefore you will find in the bill some recommendations relating to settlement of disputes, etc., etc. But there are two other things. So the first thing is, have we discussed the recommendations for the regulations with the stakeholders, namely the Master Builders Association, who came and presented before the Parliament, the Joint Select Committee, and the contractors themselves who came and presented. And now that we have developed the regulations, I have to place on record my appreciation and the appreciation of the previous administration to the Contractor General, Mr. Dirk Harrison, Mr. E.G. Hunter, and a number of other persons, a gentleman from m and Construction Company, forget his name now, Mr. Um, Mr. Mullings, Mr. Hugh Scott, and a number of other persons who worked voluntarily as a technical, and this was coordinated by Mrs. Maraj and her team, that unit in the Ministry of Finance and Planning, who voluntarily came to the ministry to work out what could comprise the, 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 the bill and what could be um, enacted as regulations. So I have to place on record our sincere appreciation. Personally, I am deeply appreciative of, of their work. There were two other things that the committee was adamant about. And the member from the former Minister of National Security, who now is the Minister of Transport and Mining, was very vociferous. And the member from the committee, who now is the Deputy House Leader from Southwest 
Yes, I see him perk up as I call him name. Southwest St. Catherine. Where Adamant, he's a trained um, quantity surveyor and he knows about the construction industry very well. And I have to say, you made some very good contribution to the Joint Select Committee. No, no. The regulations are what we are debating. I presented the procurement bill. Yes, I said we passed that. And the questions which were raised should have, been, should, have, should, should have found themselves in the regulations. And what are these two main issues? We had a, an agreement for the set aside. Isn't that the regulations you're doing? Well, wh why didn't you say that? <laughs> no, why didn't you say that? No, no. No, no, I did. Why didn't you say you're not doing the regulations today? You said you're going to conclude the bill. You're not doing the regulations. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry. I thought what you did was you presented the regulations last week. I can still say what I have to say. I still say what I have to say. No, no, you can't tell me to sit down. You can't tell me, you can't tell me to sit down. We, <laughs> we agreed on the set aside. And what is the set aside? Set aside for the small size contractors, the SME. MSMEs, where you can't have a small business in Port Maria or in Kelitz competing with, with a large contractor like, like YP Seaton, no, you know, offense men, or these big contractors, and that the bill, the bill would put aside some, um, some clear words in the bill that says certain projects in Jamaica small contractors alone were going to be allowed to bid on and that we would also protect the jamaican large contractors from the foreign large contractors you are a member of the committee the foreign large contractors who had this advantage of finance size and international reach those two things i hope that this government realize that they are non-negotiable and should also make sure that they are included in the bill that we have before us and the regulations when they are debated. Those are my comments, and I hope the Minister of Finance will address them at some appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Clark. Mr. Speaker, I rise to give a, the closing presentation on the bill entitled an, an Act to Amend the Public Procurement Act of, and this bill is of 2018. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd first like to thank members of this Honorable House for their contribution to the debate, the opposition spokesman on finance, the member who, although he spoke on the regulations, did make a contribution. And of course, the members of staff from the Ministry of Finance, in particular those from the procurement unit headed by Mr. Seal Mirage, referenced earlier, for whom this has been a long journey, and for members of the legal unit of the Ministry of Finance and of the Attorney General's chambers. Uh, this, this bill and the amendment to the bill is uh, quite a, a complex uh, set of, of laws that are being introduced to make procurement more efficient in Jamaica. Mr. Speaker, the new procurement regime holds the promise of revolutionizing procurement in Jamaica and helping to catalyze economic growth, enhancing the potential of micro, of small, and medium-sized enterprises to compete for larger shares of GOJ procurement contracts, as the member out there passionately spoke about just now. It also holds the potential of increasing the efficiency of government in the delivery of timely services and increasing confidence in government by virtue of that. And also holds the promise of harmonizing the documentation that surrounds procurement and in allowing for electronic submission. 
Mr. Speaker, at the last sitting of the House on the 9th of May, the opposition spokesman on finance outlined a number of queries with, with respect to the bill, uh, some of which I'll address. Mr. Speaker, the issues raised ranged from concerns on the definition of key terms as well as measures for the safeguarding of the protection of dis disadvantaged economic actors participating in the public procurement process. The first issue, Mr. Speaker, in clause 2, subsection A, subsection 4C, on the definition of open bidding. Mr. Speaker, the proposal at that clause for the amendment of the definition of open bidding would in effect include restrictions with respect to international competitive bidding under Section 23 of the Act and single source procurement under Section 25 of the Act. The question posed then was with these restrictions, would this, would this apply to open bidding when it has been executed in accordance with Section 15 of the Act, included the queried Section 15, subsection 3. In response, it is to be noted, Mr. Speaker, that what Section 15, subsection 3 does is to level the playing field for all suppliers when participating in international competitive bidding by putting them on equal footing. That is, having the construction be such that there is not a need to meet the eligibility requirements at the time of bid submission and those eligibility requirements being having to satisfy registration and certain uh, tax compliance but instead meeting those requirements upon the selection of award. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable House should be aware and should note that open bidding has two broad categories for participation. The first category is international competitive bidding, where any supplier from anywhere is eligible to submit a bid without having to, a priori, fulfill the requirements of being registered with the Public Procurement Commission and submitting proof of being tax compliant. These would only be required if and when the supplier is selected for a contract award. The second form of open bidding occurs with national competitive bidding, which requires as an eligibility criteria the submission of both registration and tax compliance particulars. It must be mentioned, Mr. Speaker, that through the use of the procurement method thresholds, procurement by way of single source allows for the participation of suppliers for small value contracts without requiring prior registration. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, having considered the matter, the definition of open bidding is now being amended to delete clause 2, subsection A, subsection 4C. Mr. Speaker, the definition of bidding documents, uh, having considered the query, which is a, uh, a good one, the use of the words bidding documents in the definition of bidding documents at clause 2C uh, needs to have some amendment which has been proposed and what we will do is revert to the definition in the principal act and therefore the definition in the amendment bill will be deleted. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the definition of bid security, the interpretation of bid security at clause 2, subsection C, suggests, as it is written, that each bid security would have to be approved by the Office of the Public Procurement Policy. And that was not the intention. And as a result, the words approved by the Office have been removed from the bill with an amendment laid before the House. It should be noted, Mr. Speaker, that the various forms of bid security will be contained in the standard bidding documents which will be prescribed by regulations. Each procuring entity will be required to amend and format these prescribed forms subject to the specific procurement opportunity being pursued without the need to refer back to the office on each occasion. 
Mr. Speaker, the def definition of domestic content. The query raised in relation to Clause 2, subsection C, in the definition of domestic content was that nothing in the definition truly indicated that the domestic content was to actually be Jamaican. It was queried whether content imported by a supplier who is Jamaican would still amount to domestic content. Having reflected on the issue, it is accepted that the provision could be more specifically referenced so as not to cause any interpretation that would result in the whittling away of the protection that we are trying to provide Jamaican suppliers with. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, the word supplied has been deleted from the definition of domestic content and replaced with the word originating. In these circumstances, it is the origin of the content that is important. A reference has also been included to state that the nature of domestic content in public procurement were applicable will be prescribed by order under regulations made pursuant to this act. Mr. Speaker, Clause 2, Subsection C, in the definition of domestic margin of preference, consideration has been given to the query about the words eligible bidder, which appears in the definition of domestic content, which is not defined. In order to have a more comprehensive understanding that a domestic margin of preference is specifically applied as a special and differential treatment measure to eligible, supply, el eligible bidders who are Jamaican, the clause is being amended by adding after the words eligible bidder, the words who is Jamaican. And we've also included a definition for eligible bidder and Jamaican. These amendments, Mr. Speaker, should bring greater clarity to the provision and the overall interpretation as to who is an eligible bidder and their suitability to benefit from the domestic margin of preference. Mr. Speaker, the definition of set asides in clause 2, subsection C. The definition of set asides, Mr. Speaker, includes a reference that and I quote, a portion of the annual procurement budget of the government of Jamaica, end quote, should be set aside for national suppliers. The question raised, queried, where the annual procurement budget would be found. Having considered the issue, Mr. Speaker, an amendment has been made to the definition of set aside by inserting after the words government of Jamaica, the words contained in the approval, approved annual procurement plan. Notably, under this bill, Mr. Speaker, there is a definition for approved annual procurement plan. Mr. Speaker, I must at this point mention that the government of Jamaica has an electronic procurement platform that provides access to all public procurement information. And this includes notification, all, of procurement opportunities, electronic submission of bids, and the ability to track the procurement process through to the award of contracts. This system also has a feature, Mr. Speaker, that allows access to view each procuring entity's approved annual procurement plan, as well as the consolidated Government of Jamaica procurement plan. As the Ministry con continues the onboarding of procurement entities and suppliers, we're seeing vast improvements in the turnaround time of public procurement bidding processes. Mr. Speaker, the definition of special and differential treatment measures, with re regard to this definition, it was stated that special and differential treatment measures are applicable to disadvantaged economic actors. And it was a concern that the definition of special and differential treatment measures included no such reference to same. It should be noted that the provision specifically states that special and differential treatment measures are to be applied to give special consideration to a class of suppliers. This would no doubt include disadvantaged economic actors. Notwithstanding that, Mr. Speaker, we see that no harm could be done or is done by adding the words, after the word supplier, 
the words and to provide incentives for greater participation of disadvantaged economic actors. Mr. Speaker, it was argued in this House that Clause 11 of the bill, which deletes Section 23, Subsection 5 of the Act, would erode the protection offered to national bidders in the international competitive bidding process. Mr. Speaker, the amendment at Clause 11 of the bill should be considered in light of Section 31 of the Act, which on the whole provides for the protection of bidders who are Jamaican. Mr. Speaker, as I stated in my opening remarks, this government is intent on using public procurement, and I want the member to hear me, as a strategic tool in stimulating economic activity among micro, small, and medium-sized Jamaican enterprises that are sometimes vulnerable and in need of protection. The protection offered through the application of special and differential measures so as to, is, so as to secure greater participation of these micro, of these small, and of these medium-sized enterprises in the government of Jamaica's public procurement system. Mr. Speaker, the clarification sought regarding Clause 14 of the bill, which inserts a new Section 25, Subsection D, Subsection C, as to whether the provision is to be read conjunctively or disjunctively, this Honorable House is advised that the provision is to be read conjunctively, which means that the word and will be inserted. Let me now address, Mr. Speaker, the issue raised as to whether Clause 14 of the bill, which inserts a new Section 25G, which prohibits the contrived splintering of a single procurement into separate contracts, whether that is to be treated as an offense. As the provision is now worded, Mr. Speaker, the Act leaves it open to interpretation, depending on the gravity of the circumstances, as to whether this breach of the Act is to be treated as a civil matter or as a criminal matter. This, Mr. Speaker, is deliberate, as Section 54 of the Act provides for civil liability and Section 56 for breaches of the Act, and Section 56 provides for offenses should those breaches rise to a particular level. Yes, but some further amendments here. Listen to them. Yes, but we're... So, Mr. Speaker, we have some amendments to 25G other than those raised in the House. G is going to, 25G is going to be amended to insert the word before a procuring entity, the words the head of. So the obligation is on the head of the procuring entity. And by deleting the word apply at clause 25, subsection G, subsection A, and replacing it with words authorize the application of. So the head of the procuring entity shall not authorize the application of, and the word contrived is being deleted, and the words, uh, and the amendment also deletes the words applying any contrivance or in any other manner, and substituting the same, substituting same with the word splintering of a single procurement into separate procurements. With amendments that I've just read, Clause 25G will now read, the head of a procuring entity shall not a, authorize the application of a less competitive method of procurement than would otherwise have been applicable to a procurement by splintering of a single procurement into separate procurements. Artificially, uh, and subsection one, artificially reduce the estimated value of the procurement or to apply a procurement method in any splintered part of the procurement which would not have been applicable had it not been for the artificial splintering of the procurement. Or B, to manage or administer a procurement by a splintering of a single procurement into separate procurements to avoid 
the proper application of the procurement method thresholds or the procurement contract approval limits under this Act. Mr. Speaker, a query was raised with respect to the need for consequential amendments with respect to numbering or renumbering at clauses 20 and 21. These amendments are now detailed, Mr. Speaker, in the amendment sheet, as with the requisite men amendments I have discussed herein. Mr. Speaker, I would now also like to bring to the attention of the House a few additional amendments which we have had to make to the bill since the time of its tabling. In Clause 5, Mr. Speaker, there is an editorial amendment to subclause 2, and in the new subsection 3, the words subsection 2, subsection E, are to be deleted and substituted with the words subsection 1, subsection E. Mr. Speaker, Clause 24 of the bill amends Section 65 of the Principal Act, which affected amendments to certain enactments, more particularly described in the proposed fourth schedule of the Act. The amendment to Clause 24 has become necessary, Mr. Speaker, because of the Integrity Commission Act of 2017, which came into force on February 22nd, 2018, by appointed day notice. Mr. Speaker, you'll note from the Public Procurement Amendment Bill at Clause 24 that there was a mechanism in place to provide for the circumstances in which the Public Procurement Act came into force before the Integrity Commission Act, or alternatively, where the Integrity Commission Act came into force before the Public Procurement Act. Now that we know which has come into force before the other, this is not necessary. Mr. Speaker, as the Integrity Commission Act has now come into force, this provision, as currently worded, is no longer necessary, hence the proposed amendment shown in the amendment sheet. The Integrity Commission Act substantially repealed the Contractor General Act, but retained the provisions relating to the National Contracts Commission. The long and short titles of the Contractor General Act were amended, and that act may now be cited as the National Contracts Commission Interim Provision Act 2017. The National Contracts Commission, which was established pursuant to Section 23B of the Contractor General Act, will continue to subsist pursuant to the National Contract Commission Interim Provisions Act of 2017 until the Public Procurement Act and the Public Procurement Amendment Act are brought into force and the new Public Procurement Commission is established. Once these pieces of legislation come into force, then the National Contracts Commission Interim Provisions Act of 2017 will be repealed by the Public Procurement Act. Mr. Speaker, Clause 24 therefore deletes Section 65, renumbers Section 66 as 67, and inserts after 64 a new Section 65 which repeals the National Contracts Commission Interim Provisions Act of 2017, and which has a new marginal note which reads, and I quote, repeal of the National Contracts Commission Interim Provisions Act of 2017. Mr. Speaker, the amendment of Section 19B of the Financial Administration and Audit Act is to harmonize the provisions of that section of the Act with the new provisions of the Public Procurement Act. This was an amendment which was effected by Section 65 of the Principal Act and specified in the fourth schedule of the Act, which has been deleted and replaced by the new Section 65, as was noted previously. Please note also, Mr. Speaker, that the fourth schedule has been repealed by Clause 29 of the Bill. Mr. Speaker, Clause 24 further provides a new Section 66, Subsection 2 and Subsection 3, which respectively revoke the Financial Administration Supplies Regulations of 1963 and the Public Procurement Regulations of 2008. 
Mr. Speaker, these latter two subsections have merely been reordered. They were deleted from the reordered section 67, originally 66 of the Principal Act, and do not represent any substantive change to the section. Mr. Speaker, we all agree that public procurement is a significant avenue for stimulating economic ac activity and economic growth in Jamaica. And I, in, and I, as Minister of Finance and the Public Service, anticipate the full support of both houses of parliament, of public and private sector stakeholders as we transition to this new revolutionary paradigm of conducting government business. Mr. Speaker, I propose to take these amendments in committee and Mr. Speaker, I propose to conclude debate on the bill entitled the Public Procurement Amendment Act of 2018 and I now call upon members of this honorable house to have this bill passed today. I therefore, Mr. Speaker, ask that the bill be read a second time. Thank you. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Those against? Ayes have it. A bill entitled an act to amend the Public Procurement Act read a second time. The House will now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to consider the bill clause by clause. I now put clause one, those in favor, those against, eyes have it. I now put clause two, those in favor. Um, one second, sir. Sorry, if I may, just on clause two, um, just to note that two points. First of all, in the definition of open bidding, in the current, in the act itself, the three limbs of it, A, B, and C, are conjunctive. In other words, the word and is expressly stated there. Uh, so you have to meet A, B, and C. With the amendment, we won't have a C any law. We'll have an A and a B. But there is no, the, 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 conjunction, the, yeah, the conjunction has been eliminated. And I don't think that's, that would be um, interpreted as a deliberate step on our part. Because it, it was there before and it's being removed now. I don't think that's intended. So I think we should have, make sure the conjunction remains. Just to be clear, I mean, open, there are two types of open bidding. You have in the international competitive bidding and you have national competitive bidding, but they're, they're, two, they're separate. So in the Principal Act, A still remains and it deals with international competitive bidding. And then with this amendment, we have B, right. which says in the case of national competitive bidding. And the two are, the two are distinct. Well, all I'm saying is currently in the Principal Act, mm. Open bidding means a bidding process in which A, B, and C. That's what it currently says. Oh. All right? So if it, if it is intended to change that, so it's not A and B, then no, I think it's we should... Not and, it's not, it should not be and. Well, it should be or then. It, yes. It's, so, it's but e A or B. Exactly. It's either all, one of them. Right. It's con so let us say or then. Because right the now what we've done after, is we, we've taken a. out the and and we haven't put in the or. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So if we could just ask them to fix that. Yes, I'm yeah. agreeing with that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other point, the other point, um, sir, in relation, relates to 
the, the paragraph G of th item three, I suppose, of the amendments to clause two. So in, in G, we insert some new definitions in there. 25G you're talking about? No, 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 no. In two, in the same clause two amendments, yeah? Which is where we are. There's a G on page two of your amendment sheet, yeah? Page two of your amendment sheet. Yes. Right? Yeah? yeah? Down the bottom. I notice that we have, we say Jamaica, we're adding a definition of Jamaican or from or made in Jamaica. And then it goes on to say, in respect of special and differential treatment measures. And I wasn't quite sure, it wasn't immediately obvious why we have those words in there, the words in respect of special or differential treatment measures, because if you look in the definition of special or d differential treatment measures, there's no reference to Jamaica or anything like that. And I was looking at the other provisions in the bill where, where there are references to that, and I didn't see any, anything to do with Jamaica specifically in it, so I wasn't sure why we had those words in respect of special or differential treatment measures. Um, but I, I, I would have thought that we were just defining what Jamaica, Jamaican or made from, from Jamaica means generally for the purposes of the act, and we are setting it out here. It's just that it, the, 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 the Jamaicanness arises mm -hmm. when you're discussing special and differential treatment measures, the set aside, the domestic marginal preference, and other methods. It's not, it doesn't arise anywhere else. So it's just out of abundance of it not being uh, misused or misunderstood. Yeah. The relevance is with respect to special and differential treatments. Yeah, I'm just, for, if you look at, for example, the definition of special and differential treatment measures on page four of the bill, for example, it doesn't have any reference to Jamaican or, may, or what are the other words you have here? Um, Jamaican or from or made in Jamaica. It doesn't, it's just peculiar to define it in the context of those words when those words don't use the defined term. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, it, 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 it becomes necessary because in, in order to uh, ascertain whether an entity is eligible to benefit from domestic margin of preference and set asides, a solution, I mean, a, a Trinidadian entity can't benefit from that. It, only a Jamaican entity can. So right. it's necessary to define what Jamaican means for the purpose of that subsection. Right. But I mean, I'm, it's, I, I, I'm not going to belabor it. I'm just saying it's a little odd that we're defining the meaning of Jamaican and, and the words made, what is it? Um, we're defining the words Jamaican and from or made in Jamaica in respect of special and differential treatment measures. When, when you look at the references to that in the bill and in the act, the words Jamaica and don't, don't no, arise. You know what arises, Mark? You remember when you, when you asked about the, if something is imported? Yes. That, that's the word right. Jamaica comes up there, right? Meaning it, it when we does. talk about domestic content, domestic content is content that originates in Jamaica. Well, I'm surprised we don't define it by, ref in other words, why we don't say Jamaican or from or made in Jamaica for the purpose of the definition of domestic content. No, beca okay. no because the bigger category is, is special and differential treatments. Domestic content is just one subset of it. Yeah. So it's a safer to divide it for the, to have it for the entire section. It's only, it's only domestic content Domestic margin of preference, set asides, and the third one. It's only those three. Yeah. Um, it's more from a drafting perspective. It's kind of unusual to define it by, for the purpose of something which doesn't use the defined term in it. But as I say, I'm not belaboring the point. The other point I want to make in the context of this is in B3 on page 3, which is part of the same definition of Jamaican and from or made in Jamaica. Huh? Yeah. No, the, the words substantially owned and effectively controlled. Yeah, those are not defined terms in this act. We have a definition which we put into the Companies Act in 2017 in the Companies Amendment Bill of ultimate effective control and ultimate ownership. 
No, I, I definitely, I, 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 are you ready? I completely anticipated that. I asked, yeah. I put that question back as well. I've been advised by the CPC uh, that this is the way it ought to be defined given case law and, and so forth. I had the same, uh, but I, it's not something that I, I you know, yeah. want to change at this time. Well, yeah. I'm just pointing out that we have specifically given meaning to those expressions for company law purposes in the Companies Amendment Act 2017, so there's a clear defined meaning of, as to what they are, and we're not using those phrases, we're using something else. So the question what they mean arises. Uh, so I, I'm not going to belabor yeah. it, but I'm just pointing out that if I were in their shoes, I'd tell them to fix that, but yeah. that's the difference. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yes. um, that very useful exchange between the two lawyers. Um, Mr. Minister, I don't have the principal act before me. You have it there? Where do you find the settlement of dispute between a contracting entity and a contractor? Could you refresh us as to where it is and just what it says? Because that was a major point of conflict. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole process that deals with it. What the amendment does, which I believe the Joint Select Committee considered, was that it allows for a standoff period between the announcement of the award of the contract and the contract being consummated for those who are not selected to uh, have some means of appeal. When the contract is awarded, and during the execution of the contract, a dispute has arisen. I think it is very, very important. Maybe you could just break and let the, your technical people advise you, because this was a major contention of the contractors some, some so, years ago with the... Yeah, remember, it, it's dealt with in a substantial bill. Now we're dealing with amendments to the bill. I know, I'm just, yeah. you know, I'm just uh, asking you, since you have the principal act with you. No, remember, this is not, uh, with the greatest of respect, we're going through the amendments clause by clause. This is not the, the I can no, answer I your question. No, I'm aware of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just asking you um, 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 where no, you remember. have the settlement of dispute. Just ask it. Remember, we are dealing with clause two now. So we are going through clause by clause. So let us proceed along those lines. I now I know put the amendment to clause two. Those in favor? Those against? I have it. I put clause two as amended. Those in favor? I put clause two as amended. Those in favor, those against, eyes have it. I put clause three. Those in favor, those against, eyes have it. I now put clause four. Sorry, I put clause four two. Put clause, put them. Um, I put clause four. 228. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes have it. I put clause 29. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes have it. I put the title and an acting clause. Those in favor? Uh, speaker, speaker, let's recommit clause 2. We're, we're going to do a, a, a fix to this amendment in the definition of of Jamaican. Proposed amendment to, to the amendment. It relates to the definition, the new definition of Jamaican or, fr or, or from or made in Jamaica. And it's in paragraph B which says, in relation to a body, means a body, one, two, and three. And what I'm proposing, and I think the Attorney General is minded to agree with me, that it could read, more than 50% of the equity interest in which is under and these are new words, under the 
ultimate effective control or the ultimate ownership of a Jamaican. And, and you, the words, as and we can use in brackets, as defined in the Companies Act, because those words are defined in the Companies Act now. So under the effective, sorry, under the ultimate effective control or ultimate ownership, in brackets, as defined in the Companies Act, close brackets, of a Jamaican. So just, be, yeah. uh, just to read it one more time, because people are making notes. I, 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 I put the amendment to clause two. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those against? Ayes have it. I put clause yeah. two as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Ayes have it. I, I know we commit all the clauses back to clause six. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. I know put clause six to thirteen. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. Uh, I know put clause fourteen. There's an amendment to clause fourteen. I now put the amendment. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes of it. I put clause 14 as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes of it. I put clause 15 to 19. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes of it. I now put Class 20. Oh, there's an amendment to part class 20. I put the amendment to class 20. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. I put class 20 as amended. Those Aye. in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. Aye. I now put the amendment to class 21. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. I put class 21 as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. I now put clause 23. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. I put clause 22 to 23. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. The, I now put the amendment to clause 24. Those in favor? Those against, I have it. I put class 24 as amended. Those in favor? Those against, I have it. I put 25 to 29. Those in favor? Those against, I have it. I put the title and enacting clause. Those in favor? Those against, I have it. The question is that. I put, I put, the question is that I do report the bill as having passed committee stage with, without, with 23 amendments. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? I have it. Mr. Speaker, I, I now ask that the bill be read. I do report the bill as having passed committee stage with 23 amendments. 
Mr. Speaker, I now ask that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? Eyes have it. A bill entitled an act to amend the procurement, the public procurement act, read a third time and the past. House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we will now resume the sectoral debates. Finally. Finally, sir. Have last and we have three speakers today, starting with the Minister of Energy, Technology, and everything else. He will be followed by Minister Daryl Vaz, who will speak on behalf of the great Ministry of Come right in, Prime Minister. You're not that important. You're not that important. Economic growth and job creation, and you see the Prime Minister has just walked in, especially to listen to these debates. And then that will be followed by Mrs. Honorable Favel Williams from the Ministry of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask, oh, welcome back, Mr. Speaker. I ask that you invite Dr. Andrew Wheatley to speak, but before doing so, this Honorable House might have overlooked, despite the fact that the Speaker drew reference to it, that the father of the Minister in the Ministry of uh, Economic Growth and Job Creation is with us in the well of the House, former Minister of Industry <laughs> Commerce, with whom I worked for years, and a matter that I enjoyed very much. Welcome. Former minister, I was deputy to him, and proudly so. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask you to invite the minister of, of mining, of um, energy and technology and BPO and everything else um, to address us. Uh, Mr. Samudo, we did welcome Mr. Vaz. And uh, since you re-welcome him, we'll have to recognize Mr. Stone as a former minister, too. <laughs> Dr. Wheatley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It has been indeed a very long wait. Mr. Speaker, I rise and give thanks to God for sparing us as a nation so that we can all gather again in this house to discuss the people's business and recommit ourselves as instruments of his will. Mr. Speaker, I must take this opportunity to specially recognize my family, my constituents of South Central St. Catherine, whom I continue to dutifully represent in this honorable house, the most honorable prime minister, my cabinet colleagues, and members of this honorable house, officers, delegates, and members of the Jamaica Labor Party, Councillor Jennifer Hull, and Mr. Mark McLean, who will be elected councillor for the Olmsted Division this Friday. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to use this opportunity to make special mention of the contribution and the support of the former councillor of the Homestead Division, Owen Palmer. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I must recognize my constituency executive, constituency office staff, along with other members of my personal and support team. I'd also like to mention my advisors, my permanent secretary and my team at the ministry, who continue to give me their unwavering support. I wish also, Mr. Speaker, to 
thank the various heads of agencies and divisions within the ministry, as well as the chairpersons and directors of the state boards falling under the purview of the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology. Mr. Speaker, I have much to cover in a short time. My presentation today will focus on what we have done over the past year and what we will be doing this coming year. Mr. Speaker, the message I want to leave with the House and Jamaicans listening and watching is that my team at the Ministry has spent the past year working hard and meeting goals. You know, Mr. Speaker, I've been inspired by the words of the song, Give Them the Ride, track number nine on Sizzler's Smash 1997 album, Black Woman and Child. In that song, Mr. Speaker, Sizzler declares that words without works can sustain. And today, Mr. Speaker, I will speak about how the Ministry of Science, Energy, and Technology has been doing work, not just using words. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I have 10 year members on that side brag about having rolled the wicket that we are playing on and having created the foundation, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know, Mr. Speaker, that the member from South East St. Andrew, as an avid cricket fan, and even the member from East Kingston and Port Royal, know only too well that a groundsman prepares a wicket and then goes to the sideline to watch the cricketers in action on the pitch. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if we are to... First class batsman. Mr. Speaker, if we are to accept... If we have to accept them, Mr. Speaker, as groundsmen, then they are now sitting in the shade watching as my team and I make runs. Sometimes we take singles, Mr. Speaker, because that's what's on offer. Sometimes a ball rears up off a bad spot on the pitch, trying to strike us on the helmet, but we just sway and navigate the delivery, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know where our crease is, so we won't get stumped. Even as we dance on the wicket, Mr. Speaker, to hit some deliveries over long off for six. Mr. Speaker, as you will see over the course of my presentation, my team's innings have so far featured several boundaries, and we continue to play with fluency as we continue to pile on the runs. Let me show you, Mr. Speaker, how in real terms my team has been doing the work and not just using words. Mr. Speaker, for quite a number of years, the science portfolio has been neglected. And I made a commitment on assuming office that I would address this matter, Mr. Speaker. Let me also state that once faced with all of the information, the extent of the neglect was even more than I had imagined. But as a true scientist, Mr. Speaker, in charge of the portfolio, I was not going to allow this to continue. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to announce that after a decade and a half of talking about the need for an updated policy direction, the proposed National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy is on its way to Cabinet. Mr. Speaker, we seek public feedback on our vision to use science and its applications to pursue our aspiration for inclusive and sustainable development, global competitiveness and long-term resilience. Mr. Speaker, we propose to achieve this via four major actions. One is to connect the major players in science, technology, and innovation. And in essence, Mr. Speaker, what we are seeking to do, or will be doing, is to systematically transform the ideas and research results within the scientific community into products and processes that can be readily absorbed by productive and legislative firms. Then this national system, Mr. Speaker, of innovation will generate, store, and transfer knowledge and technologies that promote growth, competitiveness, and efficient delivery of public goods. Mr. Speaker, we also seek to foster 
a culture of innovation. Mr. Speaker, all Jamaicans at the personal, public, corporate, and political levels will and must understand the value of STNI to their own pursuit for prosperity. We will promote new behaviors and attitudes towards inquiry, discovery, risk, and new knowledge to foster a culture of creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and increase interest, Mr. Speaker, in science and technology careers. We also, Mr. Speaker, will seek to drive our development agenda using STNI and also develop a world-class capacity and reputation of innovation. Mr. Speaker, Jamaica will become a leader in providing knowledge and strategic innovations for Jamaica and beyond. Increased investment, Mr. Speaker, in human talent will ensure that there is a critical mass of competent scientists, technicians, engineers, and STEM educators that are prepared for and can contribute to the world of tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, Jamaica's first long-term STNI policy, a national, a national implementation plan, will govern its action by aligning the strategic operations of all ministries, departments, and agencies, and of course, Mr. Speaker, relevant academic and private bodies. Mr. Speaker, this is how you put runs on the board. This is how you energize and empower our people for national growth. Works, Mr. Speaker, not just words. In fact, Mr. Speaker, Jamaica has defined itself as a regional and international leader in science. And it is critical that we continue to put in place key initiatives in the science portfolio. In the past year, Mr. Speaker, we have been quite successful in this regard. Let me quickly speak to some of these successes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the International Center for Environmental and Nuclear Sciences, ISENSE, is now a resource hub for nuclear technology for small island developing states. ISENSE, Mr. Speaker, operates the Caribbean's only nuclear reactor. And this designation, Mr. Speaker, means that Jamaica is leading the way among small islands in using nuclear science to improve human health, agriculture, water management, safety, and security. Mr. Speaker, Jamaica was successfully installed as first Vice President of the Organization of American States Committee for Science and Technology at the fifth meeting of ministers and high-level authorities for science and technology in Medellin, Colombia last year. For the first time, Mr. Speaker, a Caribbean nation will lead COMSIT in the formulation and implementation of OAS policies for scientific, technology, and innovation development. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Jamaica leads the Caribbean in its installation into the International Network for Government Science Advice, a collaborative platform, Mr. Speaker, for policy exchange, capacity building, and research across diverse global science advisory organizations and national systems. Mr. Speaker, there are, still mean more, there are still more runs being scored in the area of science. My ministry, Mr. Speaker, in partnership with the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa, has funded three high-impact joint research projects, projects in the, to the tune of some 60 million Jamaican dollars, Mr. Speaker. What this is saying is that this government is leading the way in providing funding support for research and development. It has always been the cry of our local scientists that there's a lack of support when it comes to funding for research and development. We believe as a government, Mr. Speaker, for us to truly achieve real growth and prosperity that we have to invest as a government in R&D. Mr. Speaker, I now want to talk about hazardous waste. Hazardous waste is often overlooked in science, Mr. Speaker. Last year, I established the Hazardous Laboratory Waste Cleanup Ad Hoc Committee. Its mandate, Mr. Speaker, was for the first time to assess and provide recommendations on how to deal with the problem 
of chemical and equipment stockpiles in our national labs. Mr. Speaker, I received the report from the committee last month, and steps are now being taken coming out of the committee's recommendations. Mr. Speaker, this administration understands that SMEs are the engine for economic development, and as such, Mr. Speaker, my ministry is committed to enabling the integration of science and technology into the small and medium enterprises to spur business growth. To that end, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to announce that the Scientific Research Council has just established and launched Jamaica's first science and technology business incubator. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Innovation Lab and Science Resource Center is the first of its kind in the region and will support entrepreneurs working on climate change research and technologies, while at the same time, Mr. Speaker, helping them bring their ideas to market. In fact, Mr. Speaker, 14 startups from around the Caribbean have already been incorporated into the OBS Accelerator program. On my watch, Mr. Speaker, the Scientific Research Council has now doubled down on its efforts to support entrepreneurs and have assisted more than 600 SMEs in capacity building, product development, and highly accrediting analytical services. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry has also had major success in the application of science and research in driving the legislative agenda for the country. Mr. Speaker, after decades of lobbying and advocacy by the medical and scientific communities, the NCST has led a multi-sectoral team in gaining approval to amend the Food and Drug Act. The amendments, Mr. Speaker, will finally characterize and regulate natural health products including nutraceuticals as independent categories for food and drugs. Mr. Speaker, let me reiterate that no longer will we ignore the scientific evidence that supports the efficacy of some of Jamaica's medicinal plants and practices. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the discussion is brewing around the use of medical marijuana. And I want to inform members of this house that medical marijuana and some of the, its scientific attributes are classified under nutraceutical, val nutraceutical values, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, simply put, this is how you put runs on the board, Mr. Speaker. This is how you energize and empower our people for national growth. Works, I say again, Mr. Speaker, not just words. No, the sweet part, no. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will now move to the technology portfolio. We have been having, we, we have been pouring on the runs, Mr. Speaker. Our last year in technology has been one where we have expanded on our successes from the previous year and continue, Mr. Speaker, to break new ground moving forward. Mr. Speaker, technology is all about work, not just talk. And I'm sure every member in this house recognizes and appreciates what we have been doing over the last year. Mr. Speaker, I will start with our continuing community access point rollout. Yes. Mr. Speaker, we are nearing 300 campsites island-wide. Now, Mr. Speaker, unlike previous campsite rollouts that were undertaken by the previous administration, our rollouts concentrated more on creating value and impact for the citizens and their communities. In other words, Mr. Speaker, we are doing it properly rather than doing it for the sake of doing it. Accordingly, Mr. Speaker, the Universal Service Fund has employed a collaborative approach with various stakeholders to provide greater effectiveness in the value 
and delivery of important benefits to communities in a sustained manner. Mr. Speaker, some of our partners are the Heart Trust NTA and the National Youth Service, the Registrar General's Department, the Social Development Commission, the National Council of Senior Citizens, and of course, the Planning Institute of Jamaica. Mr. Speaker, when I assumed office, we undertook an assessment of the state of affairs as it relates to capsites. And found, Mr. Speaker, that almost 30% were not in operation. Many of them, Mr. Speaker, were in this state because communities found it difficult to pay for electricity to run these um, campsites. To address this issue, Mr. Speaker, we have undertaken a project to retrofit existing campsites with solar PV systems. And of course, Mr. Speaker, all new campsites are being equipped with solar PV systems as well. Last year, Mr. No, Speaker, no, last year, Mr. Speaker, we, we, we targeted some 31 campsites. And I must say that we are almost near completion for the retrofitting of those 31 sites that we found closed when we assumed office, Mr. Speaker. Simply put, Mr. Speaker, this is how you put runs on the board. This, Mr. Speaker, is how you energize and empower people for national growth. Work, Mr. Speaker, not just words. Mr. Speaker, as we delivered on our mandate to connect and provide access to our citizens, five public Wi-Fi hotspots were created between April and December last year. These public Wi-Fi hotspots, Mr. Speaker, provided, uh, is providing free access to the public. These locations, Mr. Speaker, are the Nelson Mandela Park, in Alpha Tree, St. William Grand Park in Kingston, Cecil Charlton Park in Mandeville, Olympic Way in St. Andrew, Junction, Mr. Speaker, in St. Elizabeth. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, I must add that Devon House, Mr. Speaker. I know you're familiar with Devon House. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in this coming year, more free public Wi-Fi in more spaces will be available to our citizens in a variety of ways. Mr. Speaker, we are looking to extend our reach in rural Jamaica. Mr. Speaker, we are lo looking to go into Anato Bay. Brownstone, Mr. Speaker. We are going to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we connect every single nook and cranny of Jamaica, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. By the end of this year, Mr. Speaker. Order, order. Order, men. Members here in the House. The By the end of the year, speech. Mr. Speaker, we expect. By the end of this year, Mr. Speaker, we expect to see the majority of JUTC buses in the corporate area fully equipped with freely accessible Wi-Fi. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, every JUTC bus will be a hotspot. And Mr. Speaker, what is more important than anything else is that it will cost the government of Jamaica absolutely